branches of facial nerve now we can divide branches of facial nerve depending upon the location from where it is taking origin so there are branch from uh, so first one is a branch from the geniculate ganglion then there are branches within the facial canal branches in the neck and the face and branches within the parotid gland and fifthly the last one is the communicating branches so first starting with the branch from the geniculate ganglion there is only one branch arising from the geniculate ganglion which is the greater superficial petrosal nerve this is also the first branch of the facial nerve now this branch it arises from the geniculate ganglion and it gives secretomotor fibers to the lacrimal gland and the glands of the nasal mucosa and the palate next we come to the branches within the facial canal there are two branches coming from the facial canal uh, one is the nerve to stapedius and second is the cauda tympanic nerve so the nerve to stapedius it takes its origin from the second genu and it supplies the stapedius muscle and the cauda tympanic nerve it takes its origin from the mastoid segment 5 mm proximal to the stylomastoid foramen and it gives secretor motor supply to the submandibular sublingual glands and it brings taste sensation from the anterior two thirds of the tongue next we come to the branches in the neck and the face now there are two branches one is the posterior auricular nerve and second are the muscular branches so the posterior auricular nerve it takes its origin just after leaving the stylomastoid foramen and it supplies muscles of the pinna occipital belly of occipital frontalis and it communicates with the auricular branch of vagus and there are separate muscular branches to the stylohyoid muscle and the posterior belly of digastric next are the branches within the parotid gland which is which are the peripheral branches also known as the terminal branches because this is where the uh, facial nerve terminates into an upper temporofacial and a lower cervicofacial trunk which further divide into temporal zygomatic buccal marginal mandibular and cervical branches and lastly there are some communicating branches which join facial nerve with the auricular branch of vagus and this branch is responsible for supplying the concha retroauricular groove posterior meatus and outer surface of the tympanic membrane now if you see in the picture over here this is representative of all the nerves so first here we see the greater superficial petrosal nerve so first you see here that this is the meatal segment where the meatal segment starts and facial uh, nerve forms by the joining of the motor and the uh, sensory roots so uh, then continues the labyrinthine segment where the labyrinthine segment ends at the geniculate ganglion and from the geniculate ganglion arises the greater superficial petrosal nerve which supplies secretory motor fibers to the lacrimal glands and to the glands in the nasal mucosa and the palate from uh, the geniculate ganglion goes on the horizontal segment Uh, to the second genu now this is the second genu over here and from the second genu arises the nerve to stapedius which supplies the stapedius muscle now from the second genu to the stylomastoid foramen continues the mastoid segment so from the uh, mastoid segment there is another branch which is the cauda tympanic nerve and this cauda tympanic nerve is responsible for carrying taste sensation from anterior to third of the tongue and it also gives a uh, secretory motor fibers to the sublingual and the sub submandibular glands so after the nerve has exited the skull at the level of the styloid foramen it gives off a posterior auricular nerve and then it gets also gives some muscular branches to the posterior belly of digastric and stylohyoid muscle after that it enters the parotid gland over here for its termination into an upper temporofacial division and a lower cervicofacial division which in itself again divides into five branches uh, the temporal zygomatic buccal marginal mandibular and the cervical branches and all of these five branches they are known as the pes anserinus also known as the goose feet greater petrosal nerve also known as greater superficial petrosal nerve this is the secretomotor branch of the facial nerve it takes its origin from the anterior upper portion of the geniculate ganglion 
after they which you can see in the picture over here this is a geniculate ganglion and this is where the uh, greater superficial petrosal nerve takes its origin now after taking its origin it runs anteriorly and medially from the geniculate ganglion receives a branch from the tympanic plexus then it traverses the facial hiatus on the anterior surface of the petrous part of temporal bone and enters the middle cranial fossa now it runs forward in a groove on the bone above the lesser petrosal nerve it passes beneath the trigeminal ganglion and reaches the foramen lacerum here it gets joined by the deep petrosal nerve now the deep petrosal nerve carries post ganglionic sympathetic axons from the internal carotid sympathetic plexus and after getting joined by the deep petrosal nerve it forms the nerve of pterygoid canal also known as the vidian nerve which then uh, traverses towards the pterygopalatine ganglion now after reaching the pterygopalatine ganglion uh, the it gives off fibers to supply the soft palate and the tongue and also there are some preganglionic secretory fibers from the superior salivary nucleus which end in the pterygopalatine or the spinopalatine ganglion as well and these uh, fibers then innervate the lacrimal gland and the nasal cavity so the greater uh, petrosal nerve is responsible for giving secretory motor fibers to the soft palate tongue lacrimal gland and the nasal cavity you can see in the picture over here that this is the pterygopalatine ganglion over here first you see the geniculate ganglion this is where greater superficial petrosal nerve arises now this is the greater petrosal nerve then it gets joined by the deep petrosal nerve once it is joined by the deep petrosal nerve it forms the nerve of the pterygoid palatine uh, sorry nerve of the pterygoid uh, canal and which goes and synapses in the pterygopalatine ganglion so the clinical importance of greater superficial petrosal nerve is that it is an important landmark for facial nerve identification during middle cranial fossa approach second a uh, sectioning of this nerve or the vidian nerve has been proposed in the past to treat intractable vasomotor rhinitis however the surgery is now abandoned because of the troublesome side effect of reduced uh, lacrimal secretions leading to dry eyes third combined damage to the greater superficial petrosal nerve and lesser petrosal nerve could be associated with paradoxical phenomena which includes facial hyperemia abundant salivation lacrimation and mucus secretion from the nose during eating this phenomena is explained by the development of a false relationship between the damaged nerves this is about the greater superficial petrosal nerve next is the uh, second branch of the facial nerve which is the nerve to stapedius now nerve to stapedius is a very small twig which is given off behind the pyramidal eminence and it passes through a small canal to supply the stapedius muscle you can see in the picture here this is the nerve to stapedius and how it goes forward to supply the stapedius muscle over here uh, the origin of the nerve actually uh, is very variable it can it can arise anywhere between the second genu and the stylomastoid foramen but most commonly it arises from the second genu an importance of this nerve is that the central origin of the stapedial nerve explains the normal finding of a stapedial muscle reflex in congenital facial palsy in mobius syndrome and secondly this this stapedial reflex is very important test for topographical assessment of facial nerve lesion and to assess cochlear function as this is elicited by sound impulse of plus 80 decibels so this is about the nerve to stapedius cauda tympani nerve cauda tympani nerve is a third branch of the facial nerve first coming to its origin it uh, originates about 5 mm proximal to the stylomastoid foramen so it is arising from the mastoid segment of the facial nerve now coming to its course as you can see in the picture here this is where it has uh this is where it has arisen 5 mm proximal to the stylomastoid foramen then it runs anterosuperiorly 
to enter the uh, tympanic cavity or the middle ear via the posterior canaliculus. So this is the level of the posterior canaliculus and this is where it enters the middle ear. Then it curves anteriorly across the pars flaccid of the tympanic membrane between the mucus and the fibrous layer. Adjacent to the posterior and anterior mucosal folds, it runs medial to the neck of the malleus and above the insertion of the tensor tympani. So you can see this is uh, this right here is the neck of the malleus and you can see how it runs medial to the neck of the malleus and above the insertion of the tensor tympani muscle and it goes lateral to the long process of the incus and reaches the anterior wall of the tympanic cavity. And right here at this level this is the, uh, the anterior wall of tympanic cavity it is exiting the skull uh, via the anterior canaliculus which is also known as the canal of Huguier. And this canal of Huguier is located within the medial part of the petrotympanic fissure and this is how it exits the skull. After exiting the skull, the corotympanine nerve, it enters the infratemporal fossa where it is joined by the lingual nerve. You can see in the picture over here, this is the corotympanine nerve and how it is getting joined by the lingual nerve. Now what is the function of corda tympani? Firstly, it is carrying some sensory afferent taste fiber uh, from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. And secondly, it carries some secretomotor fibers to the submaxillary and the sublingual glands with synapse in the submaxillary ganglion and then provides those secretomotor impulses. Another important thing to note for middle ear surgeries is that the facial nerve and the corda tympani they form an angle which is known as the plester's chordofacial angle and this angle is varies between 26 degree to 35 degree. In the picture over here you can see this is this right here is a chordofacial angle. So uh, you can see how it uh, takes its origin uh, at an angle of about 26 to 35 degrees. This is the plester's chordofacial angle. Coming to clinical importance of corda tympani, uh, firstly, iatrogenic corda tympani nerve injury during middle ear surgery is actually very common. So, the most frequent type of corda tympani injury is stretching rather than cutting the nerve. And the most high risk surgery for these cases are canal wall down mastoidectomy and posterior tympanotomy. So, the most common post-operative complaint for these cases would be a disturbance in the taste in the form of maybe a metallic taste and most patients they uh, experience gradual recovery and about 90% of these symptomatic patients they recover completely within the next 12 months. Secondly, this nerve is a very commonly used landmark when we are performing the posterior tympanotomy and it serves as the lateral margin of the facial recess. Posterior auricular nerve. Now this is a branch of the facial nerve right after leaving the stylomastoid foramen. So after leaving the stylomastoid foramen, the facial nerve lies below the tympanic plate lateral to the base of the styloid process and the carotid sheath. It gives off the posterior auricular nerve. You can see in the picture, this is the posterior auricular nerve and then how it passes upwards behind the ear between the parotid gland and the sternocleidomastoid and then in the notch between external acoustic meatus and the mastoid process. And this is the function of the posterior auricular nerve. It supplies the occipital belly of occipital frontalis, auricularis superior and the intrinsic auricular muscles. And the second muscular branch then divides to supply the posterior belly of digastric and the stylohyoid muscle. This is about the posterior auricular nerve. Lastly are the terminal branches of the facial nerve. So as I, as I told you earlier, uh, it divides into after entering the parotid gland, it divides into an upper temporofacial and a lower cervicofacial trunk. And these two trunks then further divide into five branches. These are the five terminal branches of the facial nerve. So the temporal branch is responsible for supplying the frontal belly of occipital frontalis, procerus, orbicularis oculi muscle and corrugator supercilii. And zygomatic branch supplies the orbicularis oculi, 
zygomaticus major and minor, levator anguli oris, levator labi superioris alecnesi. The bracal branch supplies the buccinator orbicularis oris, levator anguli oris and rosorius. Marginal mandibular branch it supplies the angle orbicularis oris, depressor anguli oris, depressor labi inferioris and mentalis. And lastly, the fifth branch which is the cervical branch, it supplies the platysma. So, you can see in the picture over here, the, these are all the muscles of facial expression. The important ones are the frontal belly of occipital frontalis, the procerus, the orbicularis oculi which is supplied by the temporal and the zygomatic branches, the corrugator supercilii, levator labi superioris, zygomaticus major, minor, buccinator, here lies the orbicularis oris, mentalis, platysma which is supplied by the cervical branch, depressor labi inferioris, depressor angli oris, rosorius, zygomaticus major, zygomaticus minor. So, these are all the facial muscles which are supplied uh, by the motor root of the, by, by a motor root of the facial nerve.